through 12. And it says, And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus a resurrection from the dead. And as and they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Anas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders which, had come, have, which has become the cornerstone. And there is a salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for what you do. And uh, so we ask you today as we're working through this story together that the inspired word of God would impact lives and illumination would go on. Um, truth would be known. Revelation would be understood. So thank you for it. And ask you, I ask you, God, right now, to do your work in each of our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know um, what your ultimate goal is. If I were to spend a little bit of time talking with you, probably after a while, we, I'd start to find out some of the things that you value, some of the things that you would hold to as dear. And it's, it's all good. I mean, I think about some of the stuff that if you were to spend a lot of time with me, you'd go, oh, he values that. That's important to him. He talks about that a lot. And, um, and it isn't necessarily a bad thing. It, it could be a bunch of things that are just amoral, that just I'm talking about, and after a while you go, you know, you talk about that a lot, it must be important to you. And I think about like your future. Think about your future. Some of you are on the cusp of something happening, and so you're thinking about that thing, that event that's going to come up, and you're, you're excited about it and, and things along the line. But I'd like you to think long term for a minute. Some of you maybe are like, I am about as long a term as I can get right now. I'm, I'm pretty late into stuff, all right? Uh, but I don't think God's ever done with us until um, the grave. I think he's got for each of us something. And, and a discussion I'll hear, and I'll hear it regularly out of people, um, is retirement. I'll hear about retirement and people looking forward to it. And there's many aspects to that. Maybe they hate their job. There are people that maybe you're here today and you just, you hate your job. And you, you have a date in mind. You're, you're looking down the road and you say, this date will happen and I will not have to deal with that anymore. Some of you may, you're just tired. It's not, that, it's not that you hate your job, it's just, I'm tired, all right? I, I've, um, you know, as you get older, you start to realize there are certain things, man, I thought I could do this the rest of my days, and it, it just isn't happening. And then some of you are, are, and I think this is what I'm about to say, I think it's a good place to be, is you've got this job, and you like it, and you, you know, you ask God to use you you're where you're at, but ultimately when retirement comes, now I will be free to do deeper things when it comes to Christ. And I think that's a really healthy way to look at it as opposed to, and I don't think there's anywhere in the Bible where it says, and I retire, and now it's my turn. Now it's what I want to do. Um, I don't see that anywhere in Scripture. It is, and what, by the way, how exciting to say, God, I don't know, it's kinda, I'm kind of scared, 
I'm kind of nervous about this, but I'm actually going to step off the throne, and I'm going I'm to ask you to take that spot, and then I'd like you to take me on an adventure, whatever that thing is. Um, so I'd ask you, if you're in the middle of, you know, you're waiting for retirement, as a Christian, because this is, I'm talking to Christians about this, because the people that don't care what God says and stuff, and they don't have any issues with that, then I, that, that's a whole nother ball game. You've got a whole nother Lord, okay? But if you're, you're, you call yourself a Christian, then he's Lord, that first of all, if you're in a job you hate, that God, you'd say, God, would you give me a love for this, or somehow change um, what my circumstance is in, but I want to be content where I'm at. I don't want to be living in this thing and live, oh, it's hell on earth and I hate this, you know. That God, I would see you and that you'd start using me. I think, he'll, I think God would have, actually like to answer that prayer. Um, but if you're on the cusp of, of heading away from that, that right now, maybe, or you are retired, that you would go, God, what do you want me to do with this? and see how he starts to answer that. And be open to it, and be obedient to whatever that, that thing is. And sometimes that's a, uh, um, a scary thing to say because some of you might go, I want to go on the mission field. Uh, some of you might hesitate on saying, you know, i actually been asking God that, but my spouse isn't too keen on that idea. Pray that God works in their life. Isn't that, I, I don't know, maybe I'm just being, I, I just think, wow, what a cool way to live. That w the adventure of saying, God, do this thing. Like every morning, just like, I don't know what you're going to do, but I want it to be about you. Wouldn't that be a kind of cool way? And then see what he starts to do as opposed to, I hate my job, miserable. And everybody sees you and go, boy, that person says they're a Christian. I'm into that. <laughs> so, just a thought. Let's throw that out there to you and uh, see what God does. But I'm telling you that there might be something that happens in the midst of you saying that I'm going to get serious about God. In fact, look at this verse with me. It is uh, 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. This is Paul as he's talking to a young pastor uh, who ultimately would hand to his congregation uh, uh, this truth. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. I want you to look at that for a second. Indeed, which means it's going to happen. All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And some of you may be going, I don't like that. And by the way, I don't like that. So in case you're going, you love it. No, I don't. But one of the byproducts of living a godly life is persecution. Okay? And by the way, it doesn't mean all who are cantankerous, annoying Christians that for some reason think that they're doing God a favor by being that way. People don't like me. Well, it may have very little to do with Jesus. <laughs> may have a lot to do with you, all right? So ask God to do a work of making you godly, and, and if that's your heart desire, it, does it say you might get persecuted? The answer is no. You will be. And there may be some of you who are like going, you know, I'm never persecuted. Could it be that maybe your godly quotient isn't um, happening? In fact, your goal, as we were talking about retirement earlier, your goal might be, I want to be comfortable. And I believe God's called us to something more. And so... I throw that out to you, encouraging you that um, if you say, I want to get serious about God, this could be, and I don't know what that looks like. I don't necessarily know what that looks like for you. Um, 
it's interesting, some, and if some of you that do international ministries or you've talked to people that are doing international ministries, there are, there's persecution that's going on in Africa that's intense, physical, bodily harm persecution going on. I believe in America, ours is more subtle. And it is actually, sometimes if, if they started doing physical things, we obviously we'd see who is serious about God because you'd, you'd clear out churches, okay? Because people, oh, I'm not going there. I, this could cost me this. But we'd start to see who the, is the real deal. But ours is more subtle. Here's ours. They might not like me if I talk about him. And so it, it has things to do with status, ego. I might lose this friend. I, this might happen. And, that, and that's real persecution in our culture. Would you be willing to give up some of the things that you think, well, that's not that important to me. Is it or isn't it? I was thinking about, I've, I've got to do a paper for a comparative world religions class on the whole topic of my sermon title, which is, is Jesus the only way to God? And as you, you and I would study the scriptures and at Grace Bible Church, we believe certain things about Jesus Christ. We believe certain things about God. We've got a doctrinal statement. If you want to go online, you could see our doctrinal statement. If you want a hard copy, we can get that to you on theologically where we stand or what we believe concerning Jesus Christ. And I believe in our time, you might be going, well, doesn't everybody know this or doesn't everybody agree on this, at least people that call themselves Christians? There are actually, I'm, this is a book entitled, Is Jesus the Only Savior? by Ronald H. Nash, one of the sources for my book. And it talks about um, alternatives to believing that Jesus is the only way. It has five listed here. Let me just throw these at to you. You might want to write these down. You can be impressive in um, dinnertime conversation. All right? Of course, if you're all here, you all heard it. So you're really not going to impress one another here, but maybe if there's a person you have dinner with that wasn't here, you could talk to them. Number one, atheism. I don't believe in God, so, or that there is a God. Two, universalism. Universalism would teach that it doesn't matter how you live, everybody's getting into heaven anyways. Okay, it's universal. Thirdly, Non-Christian religions. These would be people that would say there are many roads to God. There, there's been chapels built where they have a chapel like there, I heard about one that was actually built on the South Pole, if you can believe it. I know lots of attenders there, you know. But they did that in an attempt to be, um, have diversity. They created this chapel and on it they had like a cross and then a Star of David and then a, um, uh, something that represented Buddhism, and they were saying, we're going to build this thing understanding that on, this, on the, this, the axis of faith, they called it, the world turns. And it sounds noble. When you talk with people and, they, and, and you get in these conversations, it just sounds so in, inclusive. Um, number four is pluralism which would say, uh, it's almost like the others, but there are many roads to God, okay? And whatever somebody picks, if they're sincere, it's all good. And some of you might be going, well, a these seem like they're the same thing, but I'm just telling you, this is what is out there. And then inclusivism. And that is this, an inclusivist would say, Jesus is the only way. Now get this lingo. Jesus is the only way. But... God looks down at this world and understands that there's a lot of people that may not come across Jesus and, and understanding Jesus, so he understands their hearts, and so if they had the chance to pick Jesus, they would have. 
so we're going to let them in too. And so I may have said this, and some of you are going, you know, I believe some of that. Let me tell you where I stand and where this church stands. So in case you're wondering, do we want to keep going here? All right. And so I'm showing you my cards. I'm not trying to trick you into keep coming here, and then somehow I'll slide the gospel in. I'll, I'll, maybe if I find some sort of method that I'll, I'll say it and it won't offend you, and that, you know, Christians can have fun, and we're all, you know, it's all really good and stuff. And ultimately, then maybe I'll fool you into getting saved. Here's my cards. We would be called exclusivists. Now, I, th I looked up the word exclusive in the dictionary, and this is the name, by the way, that was given to this line of thinking. And, and when I was reading, I'm going, man, this doesn't sound nice. Not admitting of something else, incompatible, omitting from consideration or account, limited to the object or objects designated, shutting out all others from a part or share, fashionable, <laughs> charging comparatively high prices, expensive, exclusive. And there were like 12, there was like six more. And, they, and it was basically, and if I said to you, do you consider yourself exclusive? If I said that to you, there's something in us that would go, don't call me that. I don't want to come across it. That's the title for somebody that believes what I'm about to tell you. Jesus Christ is the only way to God. Amen. Period. Amen. Okay, so in case you come in here and there's a part of you that is like, oh, it just sounds so non Oprah like. By the way, the lady does a lot of great things, okay? But she doesn't know the gospel. And I get it. I get what I'm telling you from the Bible. It, it happens all the time. And there might be a part of you that want, but I just don't, I, I would like to be inclusive. You don't, we don't, who wants to send somebody to hell? I mean, you just, now there's, and by the way, it's so interesting how the line changes for different people. I say, well, what about Adolf Hitler? Well, that's different. Well, Adolf had a mother. We could, you could find out, if you spend enough time, they go, well, maybe. And so the line is this, and it's, I believe the scriptures teach it. Jesus Christ is the only way to God, Period. But what about, what about, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. God works out these details. And I know we could get into a, 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 a really interesting conversation, and that would be fine sometime. I'd be happy to do it. But right now, my job is to share with you what I believe the Bible teaches. And he teaches that Jesus Christ is the only way to God. Point number one, is Jesus the only way to God? Point number one, religion says no. Religion says no. Look at verse one again with me of Acts chapter four. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. They were speaking to the people. You see, earlier it was Peter speaking. Remember the man had been healed, Acts three. This man who had been crippled from birth, he gets healed. He said, remember Peter and John, silver and gold, we don't have any, but what we do have in the name of Jesus Christ, get up. And he doesn't just get up, he gets up and starts leaping and dancing and praising the Lord, and he goes into the temple, and people go, man, there's something's going on with this guy. It was a ruckus going on in this place of worship, and he's just excited about things of the Lord. And as he is doing that, people start making their way over because obviously this is something different. And the Bible says in Acts 3, it says, as he clung to them. He's like, I'm holding on to you guys because something happened that is amazing. I can't even explain it, but I am, you are the guys that were the vehicle that was used to get me to this place. I'm holding on to you. 
and Peter just starts sharing the truth of the gospel and uh, the whole idea of repentance and turning our heart back to God. And so, but we get to here, Peter's not the only one speaking. Now Peter and John, they must be dialoguing with people back and forth. And what, what does this mean? After this healing and Peter's sermon, both, is, both are doing this with the crowd. And so they're in the middle of it. And in the middle of it, now the authorities arrive. We see there in verse 1. The priests, these were the ordinary priests that would have conducted the evening service. This group would have been on a cycle, and there was in this, in the uh, Judaism faith there, there was 24, uh, basically 24 uh, systems here, uh, one system, but 24 groups, uh, 24 parts of a group. And what would happen is your name would come up in a certain situation where you now would be the one that would be in charge. You would be the one that would be working this. So this, this rutkus is going on in the temple gate there, the, the, the porch there, Solomon's porch there, and these people are excited and, and they're like, what's going on? Now these guys show up and there's a part of them probably that are frustrated because it's now my turn to be in charge. I finally, I've waited for this day and this is the one day you get interesting over here. And so they, they make their way over. And so these are the priests that do that. They're, they're, things are being disrupted by these apostles and this person that has been healed. The Bible also says the captain of the temple guard, this was the chief of the temple police force. They're composed of Levites, second, second in rank to the high priest, responsible for maintaining order. And then the Sadducees. Small in number, but very influential. They were the dominant religious and political force in Israel. They believed only the written law, rejected the oral tradition that the Pharisees um, had um, revived and, and leaned on. They did not believe in the resurrection of the body. They did not believe in future rewards or punishments. They, were, they did not believe in angels or spirit beings. And so you've got the priests basically temple security and the Sadducees. And I want you to notice a shift that is going on. In the Gospels, the main um, enemy of Jesus ha was the Pharisees because the Pharisees would get out at least somewhat amongst the people and they were seeing Jesus take a stand of things. Now that the apostles have not just, they're not just um, out and about, but they actually go to the temple now they're treading in the Sadducees area. And the Sadducees were big um, on the fact that we got a good thing going with Rome. We politically don't, we don't agree with them, but they let us do our thing. So don't disrupt what is going on. And you will see the Pharisees back off as enemies of Jesus. Uh, in fact, Paul becomes a follower of Christ. And they still don't like him. But ultimately, the Sadducees tar start taking over as um, the enemies of um, Jesus Christ. And they start persecuting those that are uh, followers of Christ. And by the way, that, that verse we looked at earlier, 2 Timothy, the reason if you get any persecution, and true persecution because you are taking a stand, desiring to be godly, they're not mad at you. They're mad at what you represent, Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ feels that. Because remember when Paul was confronted, or Saul was confronted, why do you persecute me, Jesus said to him. Verse 2, verse 2, Acts chapter 4. Greatly annoyed, so they came upon them greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming, and remember what one of the things that the Sadducees would not have agree, uh, believed in, in Jesus, the resurrection from the dead. They're greatly annoyed, they're disturbed. Why? Because they were teaching, these apostles, and how dare they, they don't have reputation as teachers. They've got no credentials, they've got no sanction. We waited this whole time to do what we're doing, and now you're messing things up. But a huge crowd is mesmerized. And the biggest deal that was bugging them is that they are proclaiming, and this word here proclaiming is the idea of boldly proclaiming Jesus Christ. And if this is true, that Jesus, their Messiah, rose from the dead, then they are wrong. 
and they are in big trouble. Verse 3, and they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. They could not tolerate the apostles' preaching. The authorities grabbed them, put them in jail until the next day. It was already evening. Peter's sermon must have been longer than what was recorded in Acts 3, since he began after the ninth hour. So at 3 p.m. He, he starts, and then this has been going on. The fact that it was evening meant it was too late to convene the Sanhedrin for a trial that day. Jewish law did not per, per, uh, permit trials at night. Does this sound familiar? Jewish law did not permit trials at night, but somehow they made an exception for Jesus' trial. So they're in jail. Look at verse 4. But many, look at what happens when some are persecuted, many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men, this word men here is not anthropos, it's the idea of males, the number of males came to about 5,000, which meant that there were probably more, including uh, women and children. And so this is the last time, by the way, that numbers are recorded concerning what is going on because this, the church starts to uh, increase astronomically. And a lot of it is because Christians took things seriously and the godly were persecuted and it's the blood of the martyrs that's the seed of the church. It's when you and I as Christians get serious about God and being obedient to him, and that's when he starts showing up and doing things. That I literally take the word of God and I obey it. But if we want to live, and I'm talking for all of us, Grace Bible Church, I'm talking for all of us, if we just want to ho-hum through this Christian experience and not have an impact, that is a dead church. And God wants something more for us. What we are willing to invest in. Verse 5. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem. These rulers, the chief priests, the elders, the family heads and heads of tribes, the scribes, the law experts, mostly Pharisees, so it is the next day. All these groups make up the Sanhedrin and they're gathered together in this capital city of Jerusalem. Verse 6, with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. At the time of this in incident, the Sadducees are the ruling party. Annas, not the current high priest, has been deposed by Romans in favor of his son-in-law who is Caiaphas, but Annas was the real power behind the scenes. John may have been a son of Annas. Alexander, they're not sure how he is related, but all of them have high priestly descent. And so we see here that is Jesus the only way to God? Religion says no. Secondly, point number two, if you're taking notes, morality says no. Morality says no. Look at verse 7. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired... By what power or by what name did you do this? And so we have something that happens here. If you could imagine these guys are the Sanhedrin. You guys for a second look Sanhedrin-like. Ooh, it's working. Um, and what would, what would happen is they had a, uh, the hall of the hewn stone was what the Pharisees would meet in or the Sanhedrin would meet in. And this group would actually have like a semicircle around him, around these apostles, and they would be brought in and they would have to, you think how intimidating that would be. These are the religious rulers of the time. And he is put there, semicircle, and they're all looking at. And you spent a night in jail. And remember, Peter, who, who was afraid back in the day of a little girl at a campfire, weren't you one of them? No, oh, he starts cussing out the little girl. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to appear bad to you. Now he's brought in, and he's and they've got this group of people, this austere. They know the Bible. These guys know the Old Testament. And he sits. They they stand him up there, and they say, "By and see the question there in that verse, verse seven. By." What power 
or by what name did you do this? They're setting the table there. They're asking. And by the way, have there been times where you have had opportunity to testify concerning Jesus Christ? Because let's face it, wouldn't it have been very easy for them to have all these guys and then go, you know, man, we spent a night thinking about this. I don't like jails. We're around these people. These are religious people. These are good people. It had been so tempting for them to go and, and slide away, kind of skirt the issue. And what if they had done that? What would we be looking like right now? It was because men and women took a stand that we're blessed now. So has there ever been a time where you were put in a situation and it was, it was as much as like a little girl at a campfire? Did you skirt the issue? Could I encourage you today? From this day on, speak the truth. Amen. Say, you might have dropped the ball. We all have. Let's face it, honestly. I, there's been times where I've called brothers here and said, man, I had this opportunity and a little girl campfire. God, I want to speak the truth. I want to, and, and I don't want to be obnoxious because you, did you notice this? They didn't fight. They were arrested that you didn't hear about them going and they were kicking and screaming. It was like an issue of cops. They had their shirt off and they were, they, these, they just responded to the authority that was given, that was above them. So the opportunity comes and now they're, they're, they're put before this authority and a question is asked. In what name? A name is huge. It represents character and existence and reputation and ultimately authority. By what authority did you do this? Verse 8. Then Peter, look at this, and this is the key. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders. Jesus said this is going to happen. There are going to be times where you're going to be put on the spot, and here's what you can do. Luke 12, 11 and 12. Luke 11, 12, 11. And when they bring you before the synagogues, Jesus knew this would happen. And the rulers and authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Amen. Believe that he'll show up. Study his word. Pray. But there's going to be times you're going to be put... And the, the filling of the Holy Spirit is the key. Ephesians 5, 18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Colossians 3, 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. This is the response of a person that is yielding themselves to the word and the Spirit. They still address them with respect, calling them by the titles they had been given. Verse 9. If we are examined today, look what he, I love how he puts this. If we are examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? Okay, could you imagine they're in, they're in front of him. They said, so let me get this straight. We got arrested because we did a good thing. Exhibit A crippled guy that can walk now. This is the thing you guys are worked up about? I mean, you, the, the, the lunacy of it. Let me get this straight. This is the thing. Lastly, point number three, Scripture says yes. Verse 10, almost done here. Let it be known to all of you. He's not talking to the campfire girl anymore. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel, so that in case they're wondering, you know. And by the way, there's people that compliment you because you work hard and you do good things. Do you take the credit? What an opportunity, yeah. You might, oh, but I don't want to preach every time. Maybe that's what they need to hear. They need to hear it was Christ that's made a difference. That's why I do what I do. By the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and I like this, whom you crucified, 
Whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. He, used, he uses this, uh, this thing that is from Psalm 118.22. Psalm 118, 22. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. I, I looked up some stuff concerning cornerstones, and with this I end. Jesus is the cornerstone. He is, he is what, exactly what the Father wanted. Perfect. He is, Jesus is right. And he's saying to you, and, he, and in Psalm, they, knew, they prophesied, the psalmist prophesied, this is what would happen. God would provide the perfect cornerstone for what he wanted to do in the nation of Israel, and they reject it. They said, you know what, that just doesn't have the character we want. We want something with character, and so we will reject that. And there's a lot of false messiahs that will come along. And people will build their house on that. The problem with building our house, any of us, and, I, you know, cornerstones for nowadays are more this thing that they symbolically, you know, carve out maybe the year. And so it isn't necessarily what, what it was back in the day where it was a cornerstone that started. And from there, everything was plumbed perfectly so that a building that was built would stand. Now it's kind of like a... Uh, thing that's, you know, people, you have a, like a dignitary coming, everybody's clapping, and it's so great, and they take that thing, and it usually isn't even in the corner. <laughs> it's just something that they stick into a wall, and they put mortar around and stuff, it's great, okay? But it really isn't the cornerstone. But Jesus says to you and me, and he wants this for your life and mine, he wants to be the cornerstone because he knows that if he's the cornerstone, not your wife, not your husband, not your kids, not your hobby, not your stuff, not your job. He's the cornerstone that ultimately when I build off of that, this thing is going to stand. But some of us are substituting something and we go, it kind of, it, it'll work and you wonder why our house ain't standing. I know you might be here today and you say, yeah, but Jesus is the cornerstone. Is he? That's what we want for Grace Bible Church, and that's what we want for our lives. And maybe today something needs to start with that, where you say, you know, God, you haven't been that. And I'd like you to do some remodeling. I'd like to, to say to you that I want you to be the cornerstone of my life. And then ultimately, when we come to this exclusive statement, Acts 4, 12, and there is salvation, and it's so interesting that God doesn't want us to miss this. He says, there is salvation in no one else, for there is, because he could have just, for there is, you know, this is it. He says, For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Amen. So we're, we're going to keep telling you, if you come here, Jesus Christ is the only one who saves, and he's the only one that doesn't just save, as it were, spiritually from your sins. He's the only one that saves when it comes to your house built being built. And you might be going, yeah, but this thing, it, it, it's, it's kind of close to Jesus. It isn't the cornerstone. And for a long time, you've allowed something else to be the cornerstone in your life. And I want to encourage you today to say to Jesus Christ, if you've never by faith received Jesus, to start out that way. And then maybe, maybe you've substituted some things that you would put Jesus Christ back in the place of being the cornerstone in your life. Let's pray.